Good morning, and welcome to the 11th annual Fiesta Franciscana. The Fiesta Franciscana is a speaker series sponsored by the Franciscan family in San Antonio and the Los Tres Compañeros region in Texas. Our speaker today is Sister Elia Delio, and the theme of her presentation will be Deep Incarnation. This time I'd like to introduce Valerie Arseman, our chairperson, and she will lead us in opening prayer and introduce Sister Elia. Val? Good morning, yes, Sister Elia. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks, Val. So let us all begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Most high and glorious God, we come to you this day as family, joined in common love of our seraphic father, St. Francis of Assisi. We ask your blessing this day upon Sister Elia and the gathering of our brothers and sisters of the seraphic orders. Grant us the grace to ponder Sister Elia's words and embrace them with a humble spirit. May our voices and words lead us to true faith, certain hope, and fullness of love for our vocations of serving you in the footsteps of our humble Father, St. Francis. And in doing so, bring your love and peace to all your wondrous creation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah. So now let me tell you all a little bit about Sister Elia. Sister Elia Dalio OSF lives in Washington, D.C. and holds the Josephine Connolly Chair in Christian Theology at Villanova University. Her area of research is in science and religion with interests in artificial intelligence, evolution, quantum physics, and the importance of these for Christian doctrine and life. She is the author of 23 books to date for which she has received her numerous uh, received numerous awards, including Making All Things New, Catholicity, Cosmology, and Consciousness, and The Unbearable Wholeness of Being, God, Evolution, and the Power of Love. She is the founder of the Center for Christogenesis, an online educational resource for promoting the vision of Teilhard de Chardin, and more broadly, the integration of science and religion in the 21st century. This is indeed a brief introduction of her work and accomplishments. We are privileged and delighted to have Sister Elia join our Texas Franciscan family today throughout, uh, uh, through our COVID-generated Cosmic Online WebEx presentation <laughs> and the celebration of our 11th Fiesta Franciscana in 2023. Thank you for joining us, Sister Elia. Thank you. Thank you, Val, and good morning, good people. And it's great to be with you this morning. Um, you know, despite all my work in science and religion, my roots are in the Franciscan tradition. And uh, in fact, I came into science and religion precisely because of Bonaventure and Francis of Assisi. And the way that God is really profoundly present in our uh, uh, created world. So my talk this morning is on the love of God uh, deeply imbued throughout every aspect of our life and the way Francis himself came to live in that love. Uh, and it is my belief, I want to say that I do think the Franciscan tradition has something vital to offer to today's world. So I hope we can engage in some of these um, insights and perhaps share a little this morning. Of course, I have a lot of slides, so I hope they won't be too much, but I want to, I'm gonna begin with the slides because what I like to do is contextualize things. Um, can everyone see the slides? Yes, okay, good. Uh, I want to just put it on the slideshow. How's that? Good? All right. Perfect. Thank you. So, uh, God, world, and the primacy of love. Um, let's see. First of all, let's take a look at our world. Uh, those of us who have just lived through the next hurricane, Ian, 
Um, and this is a flood uh, from several years ago. We're experiencing more floods, more more fires, more hurricanes, more more earthquakes. The the earth is in a very fragile state. And not only is the earth in a fragile state, but we're in a fragile state. We seem to be polarized and in oppositional. And um, if we don't agree with uh, each other's positions, we go into violence. And this is not the Franciscan way by any means. And so I, I do think we are uh, in many different respects, we're in earth in crisis, that there are parts of the world that are really just drying up and dying out. Uh, there are species that are being lost due to global warming and um, the shift in ecological niches. And of course, the poor are being affected disproportionately as they're being forced from their lands uh, to, to migrate to other more places for, for life. Uh, and so we, we have a very large footprint, you know, uh, in North America, which means we consume a lot and we consume more than the earth can really regenerate. So what scientists tell us is that our ecological footprint is about 23% larger than what the planet can regenerate. And that if everyone lived like an American, it would take about six planets. So that's not really possible. So we have to, in a sense, reorient the way we are living on this gifted planet of life. Uh, and here's where I think going back to you know, our roots in the Franciscan tradition and that tradition that emerged in the Middle Ages, a very, very different time from ours. Uh, one in which um, here, if I can show you here, if you can see this, that the, um, you know, the, or the, the microcosm, the human person and the macrocosm were deeply attuned to one another in the Middle Ages. There was a greater, much more harmony between the spheres. Of course, we know the story of Adam and Eve and, you know, the fall into sin and uh, the need to be reconciled to God. And so this is the world that Francis and Claire and Bonaventure all were brought up in. But we live in a very different world. And the first thing I want to do in this first part is just sort of juxtapose these two worlds. We can't just, uh, just kind of uh, import Franciscan life onto the 21st century because we do live in a very a, a radically different world, one that has been shaped by modern science. And of course, with the rise of modern science, God got pushed out in a sense as the creator and as the sustainer of the universe. And so science came in with its own explanations and its own laws. And of course, that hasn't really bode us well either. Uh, the fact is that we need God to really give direction and meaning to our lives. But I think science and religion have grown up in a sense as separate components. And of course, quite honestly, this would have been foreign to the mind of Bonaventure or Duns Scotus. They, they actually saw a unity between what we know about the natural world and what we know about the spiritual world. But we in our own time have grown up uh, with two different ways of seeing the world, one scientific and the other religious. And just to you now round out this little story, um, we're coming out of a very mechanistic world. Uh, Newton's world held reign for about 300 years or more, about 300 years. But that world was really this, a mechanistic world is one of certainty. We wanna know what's gonna happen. It's predictable. Uh, we can say what tomorrow's gonna be because we know what today is. Uh, it's hierarchical, meaning that everything has its place. You know, if you're a cog in a machine, you're a cog, that's your role. Um, you know, it's controllable uh, and there's objective reality. It's the do's and don'ts. Move the machine this way, don't move it that way. And as we know today, this world, which is probably the world that many of us grew up in, you know, you know, when you went to church on Sunday or you go to church, you sit in this pew and you do this part of thing. And so we, we tend, we have tended to form our lives very mechanistically. And we're very upset when the mechanism doesn't work uh, as it should, which is part of our struggle today. Um, and so, I think we have, you know, developed this kind of split brain syndrome where 
we're very analytical on one hand, we're very left brain, but on the other hand, we're losing a sense of passion and creativity. Francis of Assisi was a right-brained person. So passion, creativity, love, freedom, very much typical of Francis. Um, I just want to just kind of just point out to you that we're living in an, an expanding universe of about 13.8 billion years old. It's very large, very old, and very forward-looking because it has an open future. It's a very different universe from Francis and Bonaventure. But Teira de Jardin, who I think is a very deeply Franciscan at heart, said that the physical structure of the universe is love. In other words, there's a power here that keeps pulling things together and pushing them forward to something more, despite all the resistances and all the struggles of the world. And so that does bring us into this question of the Christ. Um, and of course, the Christ, when we talk about Jesus the Christ, we're talking about that love of God incarnate, that love of God made flesh. And if we go back to the Middle Ages and we say, well, why did Christ come? Well, the tradition that many grow up with is that of Thomas Aquinas, because it's the official tradition of the Catholic Church. Basically, it said, you know, there was a perfect world, so to speak, a garden of goodness, but, you know, due to the sin of Adam and Eve, there was a fall from, you know, because of disobedience and therefore a need for redemption. So Thomas Aquinas and the tradition we grew up in says, Christ came to repay the debt of sin that was incurred by Adam and Eve, that if Adam had not sinned, Christ would not have come. Now, Duns Scotus, who is the famous 14th century Franciscan theologian and philosopher, very much attuned to the spirit of Francis, said, well, no, God is love. Love is, by love, we mean the highest good. Love is that which is unitive. Love joins together. Love sees in the same direction. Love is creative, love is forward moving. And God is love means God, God, uh, that is what God is, by the way. You know, both Scotus and Bonaventure would say, God is not a being who loves, God is love. Love is what defines God. And so Scotus said, from all eternity, God will to share love with a creature ordained to grace and glory. From all eternity, God willed that there be a creature who could respond in love perfectly to God's love, and that is the Christ. So uh, this is much more scriptural, by the way. We find this in the letter to the Colossians um, and the letter to Ephesians, um, Christ being that, you know, first in God's intention to love, the firstborn of all creation. So God is deeply present in our world through love. God empties God's self. God doesn't hold anything for God's self. God gives it all away and becomes, or as Bonaventure say, humbly bends down. God is a God who in love bends over to be love um, in and through the things of this world. So God is not found through opposition to matter or independent of matter, but through matter. And this is, in a sense, the genius of Francis of Assisi. He found God precisely in and through the material world. And if anything, this is what the Franciscan tradition uh, has to offer. One of the major things we have to offer to today's world, this world is holy, precisely in its diverse material existence. So Francis and following the tradition means we take hold of God in the finite, in that which we experience, that which we see and which we can touch. And, and therefore SCOTUS and, those, and, and our tradition on the whole does not follow the tradition of original sin. Our tradition is really rooted in original love, that from all eternity, 
God has willed to love and to share love and to be love and to grow in love. And therefore Christ is first in God's intention to love and God's intention to create. Um, the Franciscan tradition maintains that this world is created out of love. It exists in love and it is oriented toward the fullness of love. It doesn't mean that sin doesn't exist. Honestly, all you have to do is get up in the morning to realize this world is really not fully together in love by any means. So both Scotus and Bonaventure would say, yes, sin exists, you know, but it's not the reason for the incarnation. It's not the reason for Christ. That's the difference. So the primary reason for Jesus Christ in our tradition is love and not sin. So we call this deep incarnation. It's not just that Jesus was born, you know, of Mary. It's that from all, from the beginning of time, 13.8 billion years ago, that divine love, God's love, has been speaking and sharing itself with every aspect of creation, every aspect of created reality. In a sense, everything from the little stars to little grains of sand to little earthworms to leaves and trees, everything is a little word of the word of God's love. Everything speaks God. Everything expresses the love of God. And Bonaventure will develop this into a whole theology of wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge deepened by love. We know in a deeper way. We just don't know head knowledge. It's not just information, but we know, you know, if you ever meet someone and, and you feel that person really knows you, it's not just your data, you know, like you have brown hair and brown, you know, eyes or you wear glasses, but they know you. That's wisdom. That wisdom sees into the depths of things because precisely it is seeing out of the depth of love. So love defines our world. The, the love of God is what is what makes our world unique and, and lovable, quite honestly. Now Bonaventure, I just want to throw him in a little bit here because I think he was really a wonderful theologian who just just so we know Bonaventure um, was elected the minister general of the Franciscan order in 1257 uh, just by way of let me just go back just so we know, um, by way of history here uh, Francis started his movement and I will talk a lot about Francis I'm getting there but he started this movement he didn't you know Francis didn't start a movement just like Jesus didn't start a church they were, in a sense, living out of this depth of God in their lives. And it was the way they came into that depth of a God presence in their lives. Francis had a deep God presence, and it really changed his life uh, so much that people were inspired by the way he was living in the world. So people started forming around him all his friends and you know cousins and people in Assisi and Perugia, they're saying, wow, this guy is really, this is, he's speaking to us about a new way of living. Um, and so the Franciscan order grew quite quickly uh, from just a handful of members in you know, 1202 to this expanding thing by 1209, you know, several thousand people, it grew like fire. Um, and Francis, never really wanted to find a movement. So he found himself in, in, a, in a rather difficult position, um, caught between his own spiritual desire to be one with God and everyone who's asking him what they should be doing. You know, sort of like running a big meeting. You know, what do you want us to do, Francis? And he's like, oh my God, what do I do with all these people? So um, by 1257, the Franciscan order had, was, was divided. There were 
uh, friars who wanted to live the primitive rule, you know, the primitive spirit of Francis. There are others who thought that they should study at the university to preach, you know, that they should study theology. And so we have the OFMs or the Friars Minor or what were known as the observants and the conventuals, those who lived in convents near the university to study. So Bonaventure was elected minister general amidst a very contentious order. He was at the university, he was studying, they called him, they said, you have to take, the, take charge here, and he did. And therefore, why I tell you this is because Bonaventure had to really reflect on who Francis of Assisi was in order to really lead the order uh, into uh, some kind of unified future, which he struggled to do. Um, but he came to realize that God is Trinity. God is three persons, an interpersonal God, a God who is the word father is um, a word that describes God as the fountain fullness of love. That's how Bonaventure described God, a fountain fullness. If you think of, if you've ever seen Niagara Falls, or uh, if you've ever seen a great, incredible gush of water, magnify that just a zillion times, and that's what this term father means, this unoriginate source of ultimate of ultimate love or ultimate goodness and the father gives everything to the son the son is everything the father is in one who is other than the father so there's this deep unity between what we call the father and the son it's love poured forth into another that's really what we're talking about here the father expresses the word of love that love of love that love of God flows forth, diffuses into another that is the Son, and the bond between them is the Spirit. That bond of love, it's just like when you fall in love with someone, there's a real bond there, right? You really, there, there's something there that's just more, that's more than the two of you in love. And that bond is the Spirit, it, it's deeply personal. And so God is a community of persons in love, Trinity which means only a God who could be communicative, sharing life, interpersonal, only this kind of God could create, right? Because what, what we're saying creation is, is an actualization. It's God spilling over into what is not God. And, and that which is not God becomes now filled with the divine life. So is this infinite God, this dynamic life of God, um, that is the divine life that is now becoming what creation is. Creation now is a mirror or a book of God's love. It's a book that's telling us about God. So what we can say is this movement of divine love doesn't terminate within God. This is not a God who, you know, just says, well, you know, I'm just full of love and I'm not sure if I really want to share it with anyone else. This is a God who just explodes in love outwards. And so the, the God of Francis of Assisi, the God of Bonaventure is a dynamic God, right? This is not a, a standoff God. This is not a God who's somewhere up in the heavens and kind of thinks, well, maybe I'll have some kind of relationship with those people down there. This is a God who loves to love. So I always think that the God of Bonaventure and Francis is a very Italian God in this way. You know, I think of God like at a big pasta festival or something, you know, a God who just loves to eat, loves to have a party, loves to share a life. Um, and so what Bonaventure says is creation is co-spoken in the divine word. That is the father's self utterance and co-loved in the spirit. If we say that, Everything about creation, the sun, every drop of water, every leaf on the, on the trees in the distance, everything is imbued with the love of God. Everything is speaking to us of God. And so it's hard to really get your head around how we have, how we destroy this planet, how we treat it as if it's something 
that's not of God, that's not holy. Uh, because from Bonaventure, building on Francis, everything is being breathed into life by the love of God. And so um, that's, you know, one of the, one of the foundations, I think, for Franciscan spirituality is very simply, God is love. And Bonaventure, like Francis, we're very Joanine. The Gospel of John is a Franciscan gospel. If you want to know which gospel should we read as Franciscans, you probably should begin with the Gospel of John, because that's the that's the gospel that really is permeating the spirit of Francis, and it's permeating the theology of both Bonaventure and Scotus. So creation is a finite expression of the infinite love of God. Think about that. Creation is a finite expression of the infinite love of God. What would our world look like if we actually went about living in this reality? Uh, realizing that God loves the world with the same love with which God eternally is. These are deep mysteries, right? And we live, unfortunately, our culture, because of the internet and so much information, is becoming shallow. And I think one thing that Franciscan spirituality invites us to is a depth. We have to we have to really see the world in its depth dimension. And what we're saying here is this world is imbued with the love of God and expresses that love. If you want to know where is God, all you have to do is look around the world because God is everywhere. <clears throat> and we're always looking for God as if God is not here. And that's because we're, you know, we've grown up with a scientific mindset that says, no, God maybe is not here. God is somewhere out there. And, and Francis and Bonaventure would say, no, God is right here, right here in the stars, in the sky, in everything we are. So Franciscan spirituality says all creation belongs to Christ. All creation is Christ filled. Did you want to go back there, Valerie? Did you want to see that? Oh. <laughs> All creation belongs to Christ. Now, does that mean that, you know, what do we do? I often get the question, what do we do about other religions? What do we do about, you know, people who are not Catholic or Christian? If we say all creation belongs to Christ, we mean all creation has the love of God within it. So every person, no matter what their their religious tradition or no tradition, every person belongs to Christ. Every person has the love of God and expresses that love in a unique way. So we live in an incarnational universe. We live in an incarnational world. We live in a world where God and the world are constantly becoming something more because we're centered in the love of God incarnate. And I do think that, you know, science can't really explain why this world keeps moving towards something more. And I think that's because it's not about science, it's about God, right? It's God who is seeking to become truly God at the heart of our world. So God comes to birth in the heart of matter when we become aware of God in matter and begin to love that God who is present here. The power of love, that's the kind of power I think we need in our world today. A power that moves, um, moves everything towards greater unity. Even Jesus, you know, Jesus, of course, if you go to the writings of Francis, you will find very, very little on Jesus, right? He only uses the name Jesus about three times in his writings. Francis of Assisi was, his focus was on actually God, the Father. He was more theocentric than Christocentric. 
but he did speak about following Christ and following the footprints of Christ. And three things, I think, three aspects of Jesus's life can help us appreciate what Francis is about. One, it's coming to a greater awareness or consciousness of God present within, right? The God who is present within me and you, present within Francis, as God was deeply present in the life of Jesus. Second, it's coming into a deeper relatedness. Anyone who lives in God, truly lives in God, is a person of deep relationality. You can't live in God and not like people. You can't live in God and say, well, I don't like this person and I don't like this thing. That's, you know, you may be a Jesus wannabe, you know, maybe a Franciscan wannabe, but you're not really living in the spirit of Francis. And a greater awareness to live out of the depth of divine love brings about wholeness. Uh, and as we will see with Francis, you know, the type of life we're called to is a difficult one. Uh, coming to an awareness of God in one's life and living out of a depth of divine love does not make life, you know, clear sailing by any means. It means that we're willing to suffer through the difficulties of life. People who don't agree with us, people who don't like us, um, maybe different positions, whether they're political positions or economic positions. But our job is to suffer through, in other words, humility, patience, forgiveness, um, in order to, in order to love um, ever more deeply. So Francis wanted to follow not just Jesus, he wanted to follow the footsteps of the crucified Christ. As we will see, his life was really about a martyrdom. He wanted to really give his life out of love for God. So I just, I, I, I like to bring in some culture because while we're attracted to Francis, sometimes we're all, you know, we're, we're distracted by our culture. And part of it is the way computer technology is really distracting our minds from the depths of our reality or our God reality. And I think, and I won't spend a lot of time here, but I just want to say that, you know, our identity and our relationality is being thinned out today by technology. I'm not opposed to technology. I love technology, but how we use it makes a huge difference to how we live in this world. And so, you know, a lot of younger generations, their phone is their selves, right? So, you know, who they are is wrapped up in who, what their phone is and what kind of phone they have and who their social media sites are and their friends are on that phone. So it's an unhealthy uh, way of life in a sense. And as Sherry Turkle says, we're alone together. And this is, I think, you know, this is a real challenge. If, if Franciscan spirituality wants to be countercultural. The question for us is how do we live in the depths of God's love in a world that now is mediated by technology? Um, alone together, why we expect more from our technologies and less from one another. So as, as Terkel says, a technology makes it easier to communicate when we wish and to disengage at will. We don't wanna to belong to something, we simply check out the, we, we, we just log out, right? So we, we can be in, we can be out at our whim. So it's all about me, basically. If I want to be in the meeting, I'll join it. If I don't want to be in the meeting, I'm out of it. So we have no sense of um, stay, staying power. Love requires staying power. You can't just fall in love. If you don't want to be there, you're just opting out of love. That never builds for relationships. It builds for loneliness. So as Turkle says, once we remove ourselves from the flow of physical, messy, untidy life. Francis, Francis of Assisi lived a physical, messy, and untidy life, quite honestly, if you, if you really look at his life. But our world of technology with our networked lives, our robotic lives, makes us less willing to get out there and take a chance. And that's it. We just keep uh, what technology has done. It is actually, in some ways, fragmenting us because we only go to those places that we, that we want to go to, and we don't go to those places we don't want to go to. 
um, people are, you know, falling in and out of relationships by logging on and logging off. If you think I'm not the one, log off, log off, and we'll be done. <laughs> and this is actually contrary to what we're about as Franciscans. But this is the culture we live in. And so we do have, you know, in a sense, a task before us. Um, what scholars show today is our interpersonal emotions are being shaped by our relationships with technology. Our constant computer use is leading to impatience. Uh, we need it now or we're out of here. Forgetfulness, I can't remember what she said two minutes ago. Uh, impulsive behavior, uh, we, you know, it's sort of like everything's a McDonald's drive through You know, we have to have it like a fast food thing. Uh, we're more narcissistic, more self-centered. Um, really, it's all about me. Uh, we, we forget, you know, and we're lonely. I mean, studies show that loneliness is actually on the rise in the culture. So there's something that's deeply amiss in our culture. And th these are the stuff, as Franciscans, we have to take note uh, and say, well, what do we have to offer? Because the spirituality is not just about us. It's not just about my personal needs. We have something, we have a role to play and God is inviting us to help shape this world. So, you know, um, as we're acting more and more to our machines, you know, as models, as replacements for humans, again, we are fragmenting, isolating and, and uh, fragmenting our modern life. And so this is my last slide here. We're in the process of making one another disappear by living more of our lives apart from humans and in the company of machines. So Francis, as we'll see with Francis of Assisi, what would Francis have done? You know, it's, it's a really interesting question. How would Francis of Assisi live today in our culture? You know, because if we are, in a sense, the disciples of Francis, we have to, in a sense, be living in the spirit that he would be living in. That's our question. Um, we can't just, we can't be involved in a technocratic world and talk about Franciscan spirituality on another side, you know, as if these two things are, have nothing in common. We have to make sense of Franciscan spirituality within the complexities of our world. And, you know, again, cyberspace is filling a psychological religious void in modern life. There's something we no longer find within ourselves, and we're seeking to find it in cyberspace. So we are losing the depth dimension, and I would call it the God dimension of our lives. And this is contrary to the spirit of Francis and Bonaventure. Here's the question I think we need to ask as Franciscans. Is a sacramental world possible? Now, if you remember uh, a sacrament, uh, from our old Baltimore Catechism, a sacrament is an outward sign of inward grace. A sacrament means that everything is, has, is holy because God is there. God is imbued. And so a sacramental world is a God-filled world. It's a holy world. And we have to ask ourselves, uh, is this a holy world? Is this a sacramental world? Or what does it take to renew that sacramentality? And here's where I think Francis of Assisi is a genius, quite honestly. And I really do. I think, I think Francis of Assisi, as, as simple as he was, and he was simple, he had the equivalent of maybe uh, a second or I don't even know if he had a third grade education, quite honestly. He, he was illiterate. He really couldn't read and write in Latin. So um, he himself described himself as simple and ignorant, but he was a spiritual genius. And here I would list four, the four P's of Franciscan spirituality that I think could be helpful to keep in mind and grow into in our very complex technocratic age. First of all, um, you know, well, I think we know his story, but you know, it's always good to give a snapshot. Uh, born into a merchant class family, um, loved attention, loved to have people around him. He was a party boy. He liked nice clothes. He probably would have been an amazon.com shopper uh, had he lived in our own age. And then he, he went into battle you know, uh, and uh, was wounded in battle. 
and as he was late, as he was recovering in a hospital, he began to rethink his life, which is, you know, sometimes suffering can be do that for us. It causes us to reevaluate our priorities. And Francis realized his life was not going in the, in the direction that really gave him fulfillment. And so he began to move away from his friends, move away from the far parties, and he began to really pray in abandoned places. And this is a saying that I love, that I think is so, uh, what I would call it the mantra, uh, uh, Thomas of Tolano uses it in his second biography of Francis. The love of him who loved us is greatly to be loved. This is what Francis himself grew into in his life. He didn't start here. He didn't really know God in any depth at the beginning of his life. He had to grow into that love. And that's what the four P's are about. I think one of the, uh, there's two things here that I think are important for Francis. One, we know the story, how he went into an abandoned church and it was sort of all broken down, but there was this crucifix there, the San Damiano crucifix. Uh, as we know, this is a ninth century Byzantine crucifix. It's It doesn't show Jesus uh, dying as a lone person on the cross, which is the Western cross. This is an Eastern cross. So you see Jesus here, it's actually this cross follows the gospel of John, uh, where there is um, uh, no real last supper in that gospel of John. There's the washing of the feet. There's also the um, those passages from chapters 14 on 14 to 17 where jesus and the father are in deep you know deep unit union there that's what this cross shows the deep union of jesus with the father and the spirit it's very trinitarian the center of this cross the, the chest area is very light filled meaning that jesus was filled with the love of god um, and therefore he offers his life he gives his life um, out of love for it, you know, into the Father's hands. He's surrounded by the disciples. And so this is the cross that spoke to Francis, where he, you know, um, Francis felt this love of God in his own life. And so we know that's what brought, brings us in. It's the experience of God, right? We're not brought in by a theological doctrine. We're not, we're not convinced by theological formulas. We are changed by our deep experiences of God. And at one point, uh, a little bit later in his career, Francis was seen praying in a garden. And these are the words he said, who are you, O God, and who am I? I think that prayer kind of sums up Francis's life. Who are you and who am I? It's our prayer as well. Who are we? What are we? And who is God for us? And so Francis makes what I would call an incarnational commitment. And if you know what makes a saint, it's not, it's not just that they're just special people. We're all, we're all called to sanctity. We're all called to be saints. But Francis made it his life job. It was his incarnational commitment. He was single-hearted. This is what he was going to do. Um, and so he began to change, right? We know that he moved away from the friends and the parties. He began to pray. And of course, the story of the leper, well known, is really Francis, it's, it's both real, but I also think it's symbolic um, that Francis, you know, was um, on his horse one day and a leper approached him and normally he would have galloped away. He couldn't stand lepers as a young man, um, that he found them um, obnoxious and repulsive. But here, um, after this change of heart, he gets down from his horse and he kisses the leper's hand and he gives the leper alms. And, and here's what I think that's, that episode is symbolic of. Francis had to confront the violence within his own self. That's the, that's the point for us. We have to, it's not just imitating Francis. We have to know who is it within our own lives that, that repels us. Who is it that we reject? Um, and, and how can we, in a sense, turn our hearts to see the love of God in that person, despite the fact that um, there's something there that really makes it difficult for us? 
And Francis himself, in his um, testimony, last will and testimony, tells us, because that early encounter was always with him. He said, what was bitter tasted sweet. He could get beyond the wound and the repulsiveness of the leper and see in there the love of God. He could see in that leper a brother. Um, and therefore, I think, you know, Francis would have been at home with the, you know, the Hindu um, notion of namaste, right? The God in me recognizes the God in you. And therefore, I think the term that best, this is a term used by Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, that um, Francis was just not a human being. He really grows into this notion of interbeing, that his life cannot be separated from or isolated from other lives. Um, he begins to really experience himself as a brother. And so the term brother or frata minor, like he's a minor brother. Uh, in other words, he's not just um, a brother, he's the lesser brother. He's really um, one who at the level of you know nature itself, he's deeply structurally related to everything. That's what the term brother means. And I don't think we should use that term too lightly, like, yeah, brother, so and so. It's not a title. A brother is not a title here. Everyone is called to be a brother and a sister if you live in the structures of those relationships. If you don't live in those structures, please refrain from doing that until you're ready to live in them, you know, because these are not titles that are, make you special. Um, how do we get into this, this, this mind of Francis? How do we enter into his heart? One thing, and I think a deeply, a big challenge for us, slowing down, right? We live on a treadmill of daily life. Like you're like up, you know, and it's like, okay, we have an hour here, we have a break here, and you know, we have 10 minutes here. Francis didn't even know what a wristwatch was. So no less a clock. Like he just basically followed the sun, which rose in the east and settled in the west. So he had this sense of, of timeless time. He would wander into the fields and vineyards, the beautiful fields and vineyards of the Umbrian Valley and just spend long periods of solitude there. We can't become holy like, like jello. You can't just add water. You know, you can't just add like a few prayers and going to church and think you're going to be made holy. It just doesn't work like that. Um, it really requires us, us as persons to make radical changes. And one is to slow down and to let go. Uh, Francis, as he began to experience um, the beauty of the fields and the forest, was often amazed with joy. You know, just the sheer gaze at the sun or, 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 or looking into the sky. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the funny thing is God is all around us, but we're so busy. We're so tied up with ourselves. Um, we never see it. And so we have a choice to make. Do we want to live a God-centered life or not? That's our choice. So I think prayer is, you know, the key here for Francis. And I think it's the key to Franciscan life. So uh, I do not think Francis really sought to become a social worker. Uh, I don't think he was about building a world that was good. He was about changing himself into one who could be a true son of God, a true follower of Christ. We have our ducks in the wrong row sometimes. Um, and I, I do appreciate all the good work on behalf of justice and, you know, we're gonna right the wrongs, but Francis never sought to right the wrongs. He really sought to know uh, himself, uh, who he was in the depth of his own life um, as a beloved of God. And so he enters into this I-thou relationship. He is first a contemplative, before he is one working with the four poor. If you read the, uh, the, uh, the biographies, you will realize that Francis spent the first few years after his conversion as a wandering hermit. He actually had the habit of a hermit. Um, and he would literally go from mountain to mountain. I don't know if you've been to Assisi, but it's a very beautiful area, very mountainous. And uh, he would pitch tent, you know, hang out with the trees, maybe at a local place, and then he would move on. So one thing about Francis that is very different from us, he was an itinerant 
So he, he, so, and the, the point is he was never attached to anything. So he lived as a wandering hermit for a few years, and then he felt called to, you know, in that leper experience to minister to the lepers and then to begin to preach the gospel. So only through prayer, you know, I think prayer is the fundamental prayer as that primary speech, um, prayer as that deep relationship with God where we encounter God and the truth of who we are in God. Who are we? I think, you know, we are in a sense, the place where God seeks to dwell and we need to know who we are uh, and what's blocking that dwelling of God. So I think Francis realized that the source of his life was the source of everything that existed. He really became a true brother uh, to creation. This is that, again, slow time, that attentiveness. So, so Francis would have likely not had a cell phone, probably if he lived in our own time, because anything that diverts our attention from the world of God's creation um, would have been an obstacle for him. Now, if you read his biographies, uh, he was no, you know, whimsy pansy. Francis had a very strong will like Claire. They're not pushovers. They had they made they had one objective and that was to love God with all that they had. And nothing was going to get in that way. And, and so what Francis, what we see in his life is everything is oriented around that love of God. So he becomes this uh brother who's at home in the world of creatures, all life, creaturely life. Um actually pulled out some things here from Thomas of Chilano, who I think in his biography, if I can find some of this stuff, but, you know, it's just the way he, he lived, um, you know, in creation, he would be in the wooded valleys, all creations strive to return the saints love, you know, and respond to his kindness with their gratitude. This is Thomas of Chilano. They smile at his caress, his requests they grant, they obey his commands. Um, Francis spoke to creation in a deeply, per he personalized things. He personalized birds and trees. Uh, where we in our Western you know, world, in our uh, very fast paced modern mindset, we treat everything as objects, as things, you know? And so uh, it's really a very different type of, of mind that Francis had. And so um, uh, Francis is in a sense like the Buddha. Uh, and by this, I mean the saints or holy persons, and that's you and me, by the way. So the saints are, 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 we are saints in the making, but we have to make the choices to be where in a sense they were. They really trained their minds. That's what sainthood is. It's you have to train your mind. Like we go to study, we, we train our mind to know a lot of stuff. We train our minds to become professional engineers and teachers. Well, we have to train our minds for God. That's really what they did. And so Francis really, in a sense, made every effort to focus his mind on that deep presence of God, on deep incarnation. And so they move. Why I'm telling you this is because they move into deeper levels of consciousness that we have as well, right? We tend to live at a very superficial level of consciousness and where so many of us are locked there. They actually overcame that and moved into deeper levels. And so um, as the Buddha says, and Francis could have said this as well because Jesus said it, right? The mind is everything. What you think you become. Jesus says, where your heart is, where your mind is, there your treasure lies. And if we want to say, what's the key to living a holy life in a complex world? It's the question of where our minds are. So we briefly went through how technology is co-opting. It's sort of taking our minds and thinning them out, right? And it has our minds scattered all over. And so we're exhausted. We can't really find what we're looking for. We're, we're frustrated, we're lonely. 
Francis, like the Buddha, they train their mind for that deeper center. And out of that deeper center of awareness, they became aware of a world that is deeply imbued for Francis with the love of God. So it's 11 o'clock already. So why don't we just pause here and maybe just, uh, I'd like you to just take two questions. What here uh, that we discussed in the last hour or so, what here uh, is important to you? What is challenging to you? And what's, what spoke to you? What is important? What is challenging? What spoke to you? Um, maybe just take 10 minutes. Let's take a stand up break and then let's just have a little discussion and we'll continue on. Okay. Does that sound good to you? Very good. Very good, sister. Okay. Very good. Okay. Um, I'm going to pause recording and we are on our break. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for. Thanks, Kathy, for posting some of your questions. Let's have a little bit discussion before we, um, and Jack, Father Jack Robinson, yes, I remember, remember you from Canterbury, so. <clears throat> okay. Um, um. Yeah, so let's have a, let's, uh, let's, um, maybe if you have questions, we can, um, I think, Stan, we'd say we, uh, post them to you or post them online. How do you want to do this? Um, let's go ahead and um, if you send me chat, um, I can read the questions, or we can we can have a. If we open up all the all the audio, it'll be a cacophony of uh, of sound. Okay. Um, so somebody like the um, down in the right hand corner, you have a little yes. looks like a balloon there. Yes, I can, yeah. I can see it. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, I can begin here. Um, Kathy Pierce uh, said, what is important? Francis is about changing himself. That is absolutely right. Um, so Francis is not about changing the world. He's about change. So here's the key. If we change ourselves, we change the world. Uh, because there's nothing that the world is, in a sense, what we are making it to be we we are our choices our decisions our relationships are what shape the world so francis intuited that in his own way i don't think he would posit that in the same way but um he was about conversion we didn't talk about conversion explicitly but that idea of turning you know we turn in a new direction would uh, francis wouldn't have a phone um probably not you know he um probably would have been a resistor to a lot of the phone technology. He didn't want anything that really separated him uh, from everything that God was involved in. And that was every aspect of creation um, and every person. And then constant computer use, absolutely. Other, other questions or concerns, put them in the chat or if you wanna ask them, I guess we can, I can try working from there. Anyone else? Deep, dark, burning questions? Or you know this, I mean, all of this is crystal clear and you've got this fully, and I'm actually talking to a world, a whole uh, community of saints here. <laughs> all right, <laughs> I see thumbs up in the middle. Are you guys Franciscans or community? Mm, what community? Um, um, can you unmute yourself? No, um, mm, okay. What, what group is that, ma'am? I have my list here. Conventual Franciscans. Oh, right. Oh, very good. Mm -hmm. And from San me. Antonio. Is that right? San Antonio? Yes, ma'am. Oh, very good. All right. So this is all crystal clear. Uh, what was taken about hearing that if everyone looked like Americans requires six planets, well, indeed, that's not that's not my <laughs> my data. That is a lot from uh, work on the ecological footprint. So our our we have limited resources uh, and too much um, uh, absorption of those resources. How did Francis deal with people who are hard to love? 
That's a very good question. We have stories, you know, from Thomas Atolano uh, and others, the Assisi compilation on how Francis dealt with people uh, who found, who he found difficult. And, uh, you know, I have to say that here's how Francis, there's one thing that here, I think that's, that's uh, striking. And it's prior, it's about prioritizing things. Um, in in one of his uh, discussions on this, from this is Thomas of Chalano's second book, Francis. It's under under the rubric Francis's dedication to prayer, and he said um, Thomas wrote that he would turn all his time into a holy leisure, in which to engrave wisdom on his heart. If visits from people of the world or any kind of business intruded. He would cut them short rather than finish them and hurry back to the things that are within. So he, you know, he made people the temples of the Holy Spirit. In other words, even difficult people, he did, uh, he made every effort, I think, to lower himself to to be there in love for the other uh even when he was rejected and he was rejected by the way by his own brothers i might say who thought he was just not up to the task of you know running the whole show but you know here's here's john the simple for example brother john the simple a very simple man uh entered the community uh and he thought to be holy, he should imitate everything Francis did. So if Francis spat, John would spit too. If he coughed, John would cough as well, sighing or sobbing along with him. If Francis lifted up his hands to heaven, John would raise him too. Now you can imagine someone who, 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 who did everything you did would drive <laughs> me absolutely crazy. And, you know, the saint noticed this and asked John, why were you doing those things? And John said, well, I want to be holy. I promise to do everything you do. And it's dangerous for me to leave anything out. So the saint didn't get angry. You know, Francis didn't say, you are a jerk, you know, stop doing this. He just said, well, John, you know, maybe, maybe just kind of be, be yourself. Um, but he didn't really, he delighted, it, Thomas writes, the saint delighted in this pure simplicity. Maybe sometimes with difficult people, we oppose them rather than flow with them, you know, and, and maybe that's part of the challenge of Francis. He learned to flow with even the most difficult of people and those hard to love. Those hard to love, maybe that hardness, we have to really Thing. It's not just about that person. There's something with an us that makes that person hard to love. So that's always what Francis looked at. You know, where was he in relationship to the other person? How would Francis respond to the world where many are trying to redefine family life and human dignity? How would he guide those promoting alternate lifestyle and lead them to God and away from sin? He wasn't about making wrongs right. He was about loving the other person. See, and this is where you have to you have to read how he's being described and how he himself uh, really speaks about his own spiritual path. We keep wanting to make quote unquote wrongs right. Like we know what the world is supposed to be like. Francis was like, nope, I only know God and the love of God. And that's where he, in a sense, puts his um, emphasis. So he would not say, oh, you're living in sin. He would strive to love the person as he meets that person. That's our task. We are not, we are not here to, um, you know, to define everything. Uh, uh, Francis, we are here to love everything. And it's love that builds relationships into justice. That's the point here. Where there's love, there will be justice. Uh, and that is the Franciscan way. Anything else is not the path of Francis. I don't know what it is, but um, 
I think we're, con you know, we have, we have these set of morals that we think everyone should conform to. There's only one set. There's only one very simple moral for Francis, and that is God is love, and and that's our guide. That's our lodestar. Um, can you expand on Buddhism? You empty yourself, but don't fill yourself. But with Christianity, you empty yourself to be open to all to fill yourself with God's love. Yeah. Well, the 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 comparison with Buddhism is really about the shift in consciousness, right? That's really what the point of it is. The Buddha came. The Buddhists strive for pure consciousness so did francis by the way to, to speak of a god consciousness is really to speak of an awareness of the depth of reality uh, and that's i think it's exactly what uh francis uh strove to do i think he would have a lot in common with the with the buddha had they met you know just in the same way that he went now to meet um the sultan you know that francis didn't shy away he did have you know, a very a, a deep commitment to the God who was incarnate, the Christian God, the God of Jesus Christ. That's his commitment. But he didn't allow that to, in a sense, be an obstacle to meeting others. He wanted to know, he knew that everyone shares a basic ground of love. I mean, whether whatever language you speak or religion you share. And, and how do we learn from the other person? If you read, you know, the, the passages on his meeting with the Sultan, I mean, Francis borrowed the 99 names from uh, uh, Allah, you know, and made them into the 86 names of the praises of God. So we have to be careful about setting up walls, um, you know, around things. Francis was very, this is why Pope Francis, of course, loved St. Francis because he is very relational, he's very personable, and he's very unitive in his outlook. What would you say to people today who maintain that spiritual is sufficient without being religious? I think this, I think, uh, I think why people have ditched religion is because there's a lot of inauthenticity in religion uh, and religious institutions. So you can't preach a God of love and, and live otherwise, you know, uh, being very um, critical, uh, setting up a lot of walls, that's, that, that doesn't speak to young generations. I think Francis would understand, and what he would do is he would preach by the example of his life, and then he was he would use words if necessary. Uh, and I think we have to be less uh, less dogmatic on you know what people should be and should not be, and strive to be more authentic in what we claim to be. If we claim to be Franciscan, we'll try living that out in a in a in a real way live out of that depth dimension of Franciscan life, because it's your life that's the, the greatest um, the greatest text, right? You know, as the old adage, you may be the only gospel someone reads this day. So if, if that, someone doesn't go to church, maybe they can know what this love of God looks like in the flesh by meeting you. Uh, and so I think, you know, I think this, this question of spiritual but not religious is one we have to, embrace as a challenge for Franciscan life uh, to ask, well, how are we living out of the depth of the spirituality? Does our, do our own lives speak of some, what do they speak? Maybe that's the question we should be asking ourselves. What do people read in us? If they just say, oh, she's so critical and she's so judgmental, they're not going to read the gospel. They're going to read someone who is, you know, very standoffish. And it, it, it simply contradicts what Bonaventure and Francis would hope for us, and that would be to bend low in love, you know, to be where people are. That's what we mean by humility. My take is that we cannot grasp God on the run. We have to slow down and engage him. Well said, Valerie. Well said. That is exactly right. We can't grasp God on the run, you know, and I think sometimes this is exactly what... We have extremely fragmented, busy lives, and we're constantly wanting some kind of depth of holiness or, you know, I want to be in the seventh mansion or whatever. Uh, it doesn't work that way, right? God is timeless. Uh, God is spaceless. God is everywhere. God is filling all things. God has all the time in the universe. So... Uh, the, the onus or the burden is really on us. We are our own obstacles to holiness, quite honestly. 
uh, we tend to um, we get all bogged down. We're all we're all tied up within ourselves uh, because of the complexities of our age. Uh, we want to solve all the wrongs and make them right according to our the way we see things. It's just not how things work, right? And so I think the Franciscan task, you know, the Franciscan challenge is what is the one love of your life? That's our question. What is it that really grabs your heart? And is it God? And if it's not, then then what what is it? Because that where your heart is, that's where the rest of you lies. Um, and, and I think we have to really just kind of engage that question. Uh, 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 the Franciscan holy ones, the saints, Francis Cl Claire was equally very, very strong minded. They did not let a lot of stuff get in the way. Uh, they didn't let people get in the way. Yep, life happens. If you're living with, well, these guys here are living together, but you know, you live with uh, a group of men or a group of women in a dormitory, you know, where there are very few private spaces, you can rest assured that it's going to be difficult, right? Human nature hasn't changed all that much. And so uh, the problem is we, um, we have a world where we can isolate ourselves if things don't go right. We can, um, you know, shut ourselves off. We can live behind a computer. We don't have to engage people if we don't want to. And so uh, the world is fragmented because we are fragmented. That's the problem. And therefore, I do think we have to slow down. You know, one thing I think we need, you know, and, and that's a question we have to ask ourselves personally and collectively. How can we slow down? How can we sort of get rid of all the busyness of our lives? And they are so busy uh, and really focus our attention. Uh, this is my last uh, saying, and then I'm gonna move on here. But studies show that we, have, we are building a world that's too complex for our little brains to handle. Uh, in other words, it's too much information and we can't, uh, our brains can't process it, you know, uh, simultaneously. So we have to, in a sense, make some choices. Um, how do you start to change these ways that are poor models of our Franciscanism to stop being impatient, oblivious, not humble? Well, I think you start living it, you know, um, you make it your effort. So always, I just want to be clear here. We don't change other people. We change ourselves. That 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 tenet just goes across all spiritual. We don't change others. We can't make things happen, but we can make ourselves happen, right? We have to happen to ourselves. And, and therefore, we will start to change the ways if we don't say, you know, well, my focus is this and I can't do that. Right. And so my focus is this. And, and you know, I invite you to, to, to do this. If it doesn't work, you have to know what is it that will get in the way of the love of God? And, you know, and what does it? You have to know what is your priority, not everyone else's. So I don't know if these are helpful, but let's move on and see, because I have a number of more slides here to go. Are you ready to move on? Yep. Good. All yes, right. Yes, All right. Let's keep going. See where we are here. And here we are. Okay. Oh, here we go. So this is one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite sayings of Francis. Walking, sitting, eating, drinking, he was focused on prayer. Think about that, right? We're talking about slowing down. What occupies our mind, whether we're walking, sitting, eating, drinking? Is it God? Is it prayer? Or is it something else? He would spend the night alone praying in abandoned churches and deserted places. Well, where are our deserted places? That's the question, right? Maybe an abandoned church, uh, since a number of churches are being abandoned today. But maybe it's just going to our quiet rooms. Maybe it's just going within ourselves. So we have to find the place where we can focus. The, the emphasis here is on focusing our mind. 
on the presence of God. Um, oops, sorry. Let's see. Uh, this is a favorite one of mine uh, from Thomas of Chilano. Talk of Jesus was always on his lips. He was always with Jesus, Jesus in his heart, Jesus in his mouth, Jesus in his ears, Jesus in his eyes, Jesus in his hands. He bore Jesus always with his whole body. It's a lyrical way, a poetic way to describe this person of Francis of Assisi, that he really was single hearted, single focused. He wasn't, he didn't allow himself to be pulled in many directions, that Jesus was everything about, it was, Jesus was everything for him and permeating his whole being. That's what we mean here by the whole body, the heart, the mouth, the ears, the eyes, the hand, the whole body. Um, and so this, I think, this is what Francis's conversion, conversion is that turning, right? That turning, the love of God that impels us, turns us in a new direction. Um, and so poverty is really important. It's fundamental, but I don't think it's spirit. It's not so much material poverty. Francis did live very, very simply, <clears throat> no doubt about it. You know, like the one tunic thing and, you know, one old pair of sandals and whatever he could find to eat in the garbage. So, you know, he was very, very simple, but poverty for him is gospel poverty where, you know, here is the, from the gospel of Luke. Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't mean that if you give all your material things to goodwill or Salvation Army, you know, God's going to reward you with heaven. It has nothing to do with that because heaven is, is opening up here on earth. So those who are poor in spirit are those who have nothing that are blocking their vision, are blocking their senses from experiencing God in the here and now. And that's why I think poverty for Francis is first and foremost spiritual poverty before material poverty, because you can give everything away and really be a very not nice person. You can be cut off. You can be selfish. You could be, you know, isolated. <clears throat> spiritual poverty is, as Leonardo Boff says, a way of being by which the individual lets things be what they are without trying to dominate them or subjugate them, or make them the objects of the will to power. It's not just giving stuff away, it's actually uh, giving oneself away. It's a renunciation of the instinct to power and to dominion over things. Power is a huge thing for us, right? Each of us wants a certain amount of power and we want control. Um, and the extent that we can let go uh, of the need to control and possess and to recognize our need for one another is what defines, I think, Francis's way of poverty. And it doesn't mean that you're never in control of anything. It means that what are you in control of? And for Francis, it's the love of God. And I think that's what we're talking about here. Again, the priorities of one's life. What is the most important? Where is your heart? and then controlling that, making sure nothing disturbs that, making sure nothing takes that away from you. Um, and therefore, I think poverty for Francis, as he himself lived to live sine proprio, not to live without things, but to live without possessing things. And I think the verb here, possessing, is fundamental, right? So we may give, a, a, we may give, all our material things away, but we possess, we hold on to our judgments. We hold on to our criticisms or our biases. We hold on to who we think is right and who we think is wrong. That is not the Franciscan way. The Franciscan way is to live without possessing. You can have these thoughts, but you can't possess them, right? You have to be able to let, let everything go. And it basically, it's a letting go and letting flow into that love of God. Yes, we all have thoughts, we all have feelings, we all have judgments, but how do we live with those within the greater priority of the love of God as the centrality of our lives? So I think, you know, for Francis, 
it is living in the fact that we do not control our own existence. And I do think, you know, one thing the modern or the postmodern world has done for us, it's given us the illusion of power and control. No one is going to tell me what to do. You know, no one is going to, you know, interfere in my life. Um, well, yes and no. I mean, Ultimately, we do not control our own existence, right? We, we're here today and the next hour, something may happen that we're no longer here. I once had a student, probably told this story before, but she was on her way to pick up her final exam. And, you know, uh, driving down a two lane highway and making a left turn, she didn't see a car coming from the blind right and she was hit. <clears throat> Um, almost head on as she was starting to make that turn and she was killed outright on her way to pick up her final exam. We don't know the day nor the hour. And I think Francis and, and Claire, you know, they kind of lived backwards. They kind of lived as if today was their last breath, as if they would meet God eternally in the next moment. And, and that's in a sense, we're always living as if, you know, our death will be up ahead or you know like god you know will become holy in the future something somewhere that's not here and i think they always lived eternity in the now and that's what we mean by poverty it's letting go of all those things that get in the way of the eternal now and therefore not to control yeah we have to make choices yeah we have to make decisions but make them and then let go and and let flow so you know, um, I think for Francis, these three movements go together. His turning into the love of God and away from the selfish self was also a releasement. And here's the truth. If you're really living in God's love, you have no real need to control, right? That's what releasement's about. You can let be. Uh, you can let other persons be, even hard people who are difficult to love. Uh, let them be. You know, they are who they are. And you have to just say, well, maybe they're doing the best that they can. It's not my way and it's certainly not how I see things. But as long as we're trying to control other people, we are never really living in that depth of God's love. So I think there is a lesson to be learned here. I also think that in this letting go, this conversion that Francis and Claire lived so deeply, um, they could just, in, in this allowing things to be, you begin to see things in a new way, quite honestly. You know, it's that, I think as Francis began, let's take the leper just as a case in point, you know, as he began to let go of his um, hatred of lepers, of his disdain for them, his rejection of them, he could begin to see uh, God's goodness precisely there in that disfigured putrid flesh um, of, of personhood you know and that's the thing once we can begin to so even if we use the language of that person is difficult underneath that difficulty there's probably the love of God waiting to be revealed and to be known to be seen <clears throat> and and therefore I think Francis's prayer was always one of thanksgiving, right? We thank you. We thank you. That kind of mantra that he had, gratitude from the Latin gratia, gift. We thank you for the gift of this person. We thank you for the gift of this life. We thank you for the gift of this difficult person that impels me to really maybe think what obstacles I have, you know, to love. And I think Francis acquired a heart full of thankfulness, gratitude, and love. The person, you know, this is a, I think Thich Nhat Hanh or someone else today, or a, a brother, Stein, a David Steindl Rast, you know, I think his work on gratitude. Gratitude is attitude, right? The attitude of gratitude, the attitude of thanksgiving and love is very, is very apropos of Francis. Um, he lived in this heart full of love. So I think what we're saying here is how we see is how we love, right? A love, if we can deepen ourselves in a consciousness 
of God's presence, a God who is love deeply present, it's that everything becomes grace-filled. The world is sacramental. As Michael Himes says, how many sacraments are there? Not seven, but seven zillion sacraments. Everything is a sacrament um, because everything is speaking now of this tremendous love of God. That is the opening up of heaven. Honestly, what do we think the reign of God is going to look like? You know, I have no idea, nor, nor is heaven some place that's above us, that's very platonic. Heaven is this world truly seen in its root reality. And what God promises is a new heaven and a new earth, not a new earth without heaven or a new heaven without earth. This is not biblical. And so what we're saying is this earth has the capacity, the potential to be transformed in the love of God and to become that love deeply expressed in this created reality. So I think for Francis, you know, this spirituality of a deepening of self in the love of God and a conversion of self in that love is what opens him up to become a brother, a, a truly relational being. So the word Pietas, piety. It's not piety, though, like you love the stations of the cross, piety. That's not a bad thing. It's just that pietas speaks to the quality of deep relatedness, like the pieta from Michelangelo, you know, where uh, Mary is holding her dead son um, in that deep sorrow. Uh, and that's what relatedness is. So that one who is related truly related, not only just loves on good days, but really has a sense of the sorrow of, of, of everything, you know, the fragility of, of people, the fragility of life. And so this pietas that leads to compassion. I think Francis and compassion is a deeply Franciscan value, right? I think, um, <clears throat> You know, Francis of Assisi was a deeply, he felt the sufferings of the, he felt the sufferings of his brothers, even though they annoyed him, even though they got him upset, he felt their fragility. And so attentiveness to things happening in the world as people's lives unfold. And therefore the Franciscan, you know, path is to be a person of compassion, to heal wounds to heal, how do we heal wounds? How do we heal our own wounds? I think there's a lot of woundedness today, wounded hearts, wounded people. We're living with, you know, um, all sorts of wounds, physical wounds, emotional wounds, psychological wounds. How do we heal them? If not by a power of love that can bind together that which is um, divided. Uh, to unite what has fallen apart. You see, all of these things, again, I look at the way we approach works of justice and we make them works, something to do. Whereas the Franciscan approach is to what we are. It's how we are being healed and help heal. As we are unitive within ourselves and help to unite that which is around us. How we are at home with that deep love of God within ourselves and help others find their way home to those who have lost their way. We are in a sense what the world is coming, becoming. And that's how we go about the world. Uh, as we are becoming, the world becomes. And what is the most, you know, unfortunate thing is where we are not truthful and not living what we claim to live. And therefore we divide the world. The world is not a neutral place. We either help build it up in love or we divide it, but we stand on one side or the other. And so we do need a heart to heart encounter. The word engagement is a good Franciscan value. Right? We engage, we pull into our orbit as we leave our worlds and go into another world's uh, 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 
another person's world. Engagement is crossing the threshold. That's really what it's about. Engagement with the others, I leave my comfortable private zone and I go into the world of another where I encounter God. What does it mean to encounter God in the other? It really means just let the other be other in their uniqueness, in their weirdness, in their strange way they tell jokes, in the way they smile, in the way they look. All of that is God being expressed um, because God is infinite in God's love. That love is inexhaustible and delights in the rich diversity of what we are and what creation is. So en engagement is out of oneself and into the other by way of vision. Seeing for the Franciscan is everything. And physical sight for Francis is, is blended with spiritual sight. I think, I, I know I use this saying a lot from Angela Foligno, but I love it because she was deeply Franciscan, uh, the Franciscan penitent, Angela Foligno. She said, as we see, so we love, right? If we are blind to what we are beholding, we will not love. And that's, I think, what being within compassion means for Francis. He saw, you know, and, and seeing is a matter of the mind, right? It's not just physical. Oh, she has, you know, she's short, and she's, she's quiet, or he's, he's nice, but he's a standoff guy, you know. You have to really see deeply. That's what it means. The deeper that we can see within ourselves is the depth with which we can see others. And as we see, we then unite with them. We are with them in compassion. We feel with them. We unite with them. So compassion for Francis to receive from others. That is the first thing, right? We are always about doing. Oh, what can I do for you? Right? That's the whole first question. Like our thing is, oh, we have to work with the poor so we can help them. Francis is the opposite, right? He has an in, so the logic of love is not the logic of the intellect. Unfortunately, we follow a lot of intellectual knowledge. Logically, I have more and I should be doing for that person who has less. Francis says, no, that lesser person has something rich and infinite in value to give me. And so he first we seize from the other. That's how he tastes the goodness of God in the le leper. Then he holds their pain. He feels with them. He listens to them. Many of the stories from Chalano and Bonaventure, we hear, we, we see Francis attentive. So one of the things that we are losing today in our technocratic uh, world is attention. We have attention deficit we have sort of attention thinning out. Our attention is all over. We need things in bite-sized pieces because we have such a short attention span. That is not Francis. Of course, in his day, uh, it was all the time in the world to listen to people, to allow people to tell their stories, to connect with them into the wider story of life itself. Um, and so attentiveness, uh, listening to the other, seeing the other, you can see that this is a spirituality of the senses, right? It's not an intellectual spirituality. We're not looking to think our way into heaven. Ours is about feeling a world where God is struggling to be made known. And so it's being attentive even to the fragility of nature, things struggling to be born and to be noticed. So when we live in this awareness of interconnectivity, then I think it's easy for us, if we know ourselves, to be truly related to everything, to other people, to nature itself, to trees, to little earthworms, to, to little annoying flies on the wall then compassion arises. Here's just a little anecdote. Last week, I was um, sitting in my living room and this fly, brother fly, was annoying the heck out of me. He was zooming, you know, all throughout, you know, the space of the living room. He was almost making it his, his mission to interfere <laughs> with 
<laughs> my quieter time. And, you know, my thought is how can I help you see outside, get outside without trying to squish you to death? And I, 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 I tried to get him, you know, at least to get his attention, but he was very, very quick and he would zoom around and stuff. And I gave up. I just said, look, brother fly, hang out as long as you want. I'm not going to even pay, you know, I'm not going to notice you. You just do your little fly thing. The next morning I got up, you know, the poor thing just used up all his fly energy. And I saw him collapsed on the floor and I really felt sorry for him. <clears throat> that I probably drove this poor fly crazy chasing him. But in a sense, you know, we don't have that kind of time, do we? You know, we want things, we, we try to eradicate whatever is in our way as quickly as possible. But, you know, this is what compassion is about. It's feeling for even the fragile things of the earth. And, and therefore, if we can feel and see more deeply, we can think out of a different center. I actually think our thinking today is really thinned out and we make very rash decisions. We make very emotional decisions uh, that are unhelpful. So wisdom is this experiential understanding of the interconnectivity of all things. We think out of the center of love. That's really what wisdom is about. Wisdom is knowledge deepened by love. We're not thinking like to make, um, you know, to solve problems per se. We're thinking how to connect. And that's how we should be thinking. How do we how do we deepen the connections of the whole here? I do think we live in the culture of me, unfortunately, because our culture has really allowed us to become very individualized, you know, and therefore it, apathy reigns. Um, again, it's part of our technological milieu. Um, if we want to be part of it will hang out if we don't, you know, I'm off. Apathy is we don't care, we don't have feeling. It's a pathos, it's without pathos or without feeling. And I think there's so much violence and there's so much destruction in our world today, we no longer even feel uh, the suffering of the world unless that suffering really affects us directly. Part of that lack of feeling is we're very impatient, right? We talked about this before, the narcissism. But we have to have everything now. We're like the now, we're yesterday people. And that kind of living actually fails to see what's breaking in. We actually fail to see the future that is breaking in in this present moment. And of course, the culture of me is being self -preoccup we're preoccupied with ourselves, right? How does this affect me? That's always the question. How does this affect me? Well, me is important. I don't want to underestimate personhood, but I think we have to reorient, you know, our priorities and say, what is me? You know, what is the self that's being preoccupied? Maybe that's the first question. A and how can we turn those tables so that the self really becomes the truth of the matter is we really become ourselves only in union with another. You know, it's union with an other that distinguishes our true beingness. So even the self-preoccupation is an unhealthy and in a sense, uh, a fragmented sense of the self. Now, you know, Francis, I, I do think he was a spiritual genius. He, he understood the human person. He understood the human uh, predicament in his own deep way. Um, and he did know that love bears with it an openness to sorrow. So love is vulnerable, right? If you're really going to make love your mission, you can rest assured that you will have a difficult life <laughs> as, as Jesus did and as Francis did. Francis had a very, very difficult life. Uh, he did not become the birdbath saint as we may, might like to imagine him. He lived a life of um misinterpretation misunderstanding many of his followers did not understand him they misdiagnosed him uh and yet he never never wavered i think in that love of god uh his 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 uh, ideal was to live in the in the footsteps of the crucified christ to give his life you know out of love by way of suffering so, you know, as one spiritual writer says, God does not need perfect creatures to show God's power. In fact, 
There's no such thing as perfect creatures, as far as I know. God needs selfless vessels to pour out God's selfless love. And I think that sums it up best, right? You know that we are the love of God in the flesh. Francis got that. He really understood that in his own way. There's no other God out there than the God that we meet here. Uh, and the, to the extent that we can live in that God-centered love is the extent that Christ is alive. So if we talk about spiritual, not religious, well, it's because we have set up some God that's not here. That's not the Christian God. Francis lived really the Christian God, the God who is truly um, one with us. <clears throat> so compassion, love, and community all belong together. And those of you living in community, you will know this, right? So a compassionate life is a life together. Life together, even for you married folk, those of you, wherever you are in your fraternal lives, wherever, wherever two or more are gathered, there is conflict, right? Wherever two or more are gathered, there will be misunderstanding and there will be dissension. And our job <coughs> is to learn to love amidst those uh difficulties of bondedness right but we can grow and we can grow together right to begin to learn to feel together you know that the definition of love is not just sharing life together love means seeing together in the same direction that's what love is and that's what community is meant to be it's not that every day is going to be a perfect day it is that together you are looking in the same direction. That's the community that loves. And therefore, compassion needs, you know, that solidarity of the heart. It needs hearted people. It doesn't mean you're always going to get it right. It means that you, you, will, you have made a commitment to keep your heart open to love. In other words, even when you fail in love, when things don't work out, that you will start anew, which was Francis is one of his famous lines, right? Let us begin anew, for until now we have done nothing. That should be our mantra all the time. No matter how old you are, no matter how long you're married or in community together, let us start anew, for up until now, we are just beginning. So I do think this is true for Franciscan life. The neighbor is not an infringement upon our autonomy but an essential part of who we are. That is Francis, right? He really was a brother, right? Truly related to the other brothers and sisters of all created life. When people become an infringement on our otherwise lives, we have to take a check. We have to stop and pause and say, why? Why is that person, you know, an obstacle to me? And, and, and not try to change that person, try to see what within us is being um, threatened or challenged. So compassionate presence, we spoke about this before, Francis's slow time. We live on clock time, right? We live to try to get as much done and as much as possible in the shortest amount of time. Like, so can Sister Ilya please keep talking so we can finish up here and move on through our, our busy day? Um, and so cl clock time is impatience, where we're very impatient. Um, do you ever see the way people drive? I think people drive on clock time, you know, so everyone's speeding. Uh, I live on a road that should be like the, the, the speed limit should be about 25 miles an hour. Usually people are going between somewhere between 40, 60, sometimes 70 miles an hour. Everyone zoom, 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 you know, where are we going? where are we going that ha we have to get there and i think they're not people are not speeding because i think they're mindless they're not even attentive to what they're doing um and therefore this kind of mentality if our minds are speeding uh because they're all over the place we're not together we're not with anyone we're not even with ourselves quite honestly so patience begins in the discipline of compassion. And, you know, maybe the first sign here, and here I would say this would be apropos of Francis, to be compassionate with oneself, right? If you are not, um, if you are not in a sense, 
good to oneself, if you don't love the self, Jesus was clear about this, right? Love of God, love of neighbor is grounded in love of self, right? No real love of self. If you don't see God, you know, and God's love and the good that you are, there is going to be nothing, nothing else to follow, quite honestly. And we will be very impatient. We'll be very judgmental. We'll be cutting our world up, carving it up into all our little pieces that fit our impatient, fragmented minds. Not helpful. Francis, on the other hand, when you read the biographies, again, all the time in the world, I love these passages, you know, because they're so poetic. And they, they're, they're saying something to us. And our question is, can we live this in some way? And how do we live this in our own way today? But here's Francis. He spares lanterns, lamps, and candles, unwilling to use his hand to put out their brightness, which is a sign of the eternal light. All right, there is the biographer uh, bringing in some kind of platonic theme here that the light of creation mirrors the light of God. He walked reverently over rocks out of respect for him who is called the rock. So everything in creation is speaking to Francis of God. When the brothers are cutting wood, he forbids them to cut down the whole tree so that it might have hope of sprouting again. And of course, the famous one, he picks up little worms so they would not be trampled underfoot. He calls all animals by a fraternal name, especially the beasts, who he especially loves the meek. So wolves and lambs and, you know, as we read those beautiful little uh, stories, the hagiographical stories, they are, they are, in a sense, portrayed, they're descriptive, to tell us the type of spirit that Francis developed, a deep, sensitive spirit to a God-filled material world. Nothing brute here, nothing just mere matter, nothing that could be easily discarded. <clears throat> so the famous, we all know this, Francis saw the footprints of God impressed on creation. And what does that mean? It means that as you're walking, are you mindful of what you are walking on? That's what we're talking about here. It's a mindfulness of the incredible depth of matter to hold God. <clears throat> so again, Francis, nature mysticism, we hear so much today now with Laudato Si and Pope Francis's, you know, efforts to help us become aware of the, of the natural world and its need for our slowing down and relating to it. So for Francis, nothing in nature accidental or excessive, nothing, worthless, nothing is worthless or trivial. What do we see as worthless and trivial? And we have to be honest, really, and say, what is it about nature that we don't really relate to? Again, Francis, everything, no matter how small or insignificant, has infinite value. In fact, Pope Francis quotes this from Bonaventure in the encyclical Laudato Si, because it reflects God in its own unique being. So this is a deeply incarnational tradition. It takes matter seriously as the place where God is being expressed and revealed. So I always put this up because, <clears throat> but it's sort of, redundant um, because I find it actually about a million times I've used this passage and I still I love to, to use it because who thinks about worms of, you know who has a warm love for an earthworm a warm love think about that and you know picking up an earthworm or seeing that earthworm a text from Isaiah I am a worm and not a man something of godliness there and picking them up and putting them in a safe place. <clears throat> I dare anyone to do that. Or, you know, finding an abundance of flowers and preaching to them and inviting them to praise the Lord, just as if they were endowed with reason, right? People would say, okay, that person is totally crazy. They are like preaching to the flowers. But it's that type of conscious, it's a consciousness, an awareness of belonging. If we do not develop that awareness of belonging to this created world, we will not have a, a long future. We are not doing well here by any means. <clears throat> Global warming is not going away. We are getting warmer. 
And um, we have a choice to make, you know, do we want to see, and this is just not a, an ecological decision, it's a theological decision, right? And so it, it's about where is God for us? That's our question. So again, Francis's brotherhood is about presence. It's about a solidarity between humanity and creation. <clears throat> and it's a question of where is God for us? I think that's the question we need to we need to honestly ask what is God for us and where is God for us? <clears throat> we should probably even take a minute just to, I just want you to write those questions down because I want to come back to, I'll, I'll finish up and then we can come back to those questions. What is God for you and where is God for you? Do you find God in all creatures? That means the people you don't like, the little creatures you don't like. Um, <clears throat> and it's a question of, well, we can't let everything, you know, that's that people say, well, we can't let just everything, you know, exist. Well, even if we have to cut down a tree or clear away, you know, some land to, to do something, how do we do that? How do we do that in a way that is conducive to the Franciscan spirit of divine love in this place, in this tree, in, in these flowers, in this grass? Um, <clears throat> everything is about how we're doing what we're doing. So for, for we know this well. For Francis, creation is family. This is something Pope Francis is trying to really bring to our attention. I don't know if we can get here, but if you want to know, well, what can what can Franciscans do? We can really make this a priority. We how do we live this? How do we stand for it? In other words, how do we advocate for creationist family in a world that wants to uh, to say who's in and who's out as family, right? You know, for Francis, again, everything as being related to, everything is his brother and his sister, which is very much like the gospels, you know, when they ask Jesus, you're, you know, your mother and your sisters are waiting for you. Jesus says, well, who are my, my mother and my sisters and my brothers, but all those who do the will of God. And that's what we see you know, as the biographers describe the life of Francis. So everything, it, everything, not just having value for Francis, but everything having infinite value because it reflects God in its unique being. And I think that's something we have to really focus on, infinite value. It really causes us to pause in everything that we're doing, or at least to slow down everything that we're doing. Um, and so Scotus uses Duns Scotus built upon this attentiveness of Francis to every single created thing. And he called this hecceitas or thisness from hec, from the Latin hec, thisness. Everything has a point of individuality, individuated being. This is a philosophical position that really distinguishes the Franciscan intellectual tradition from the Dominican intellectual or the Thomistic intellectual tradition. Uh, Thomas is, is not about the individuation of things. He's about everything um, being created by God and participating in God. But for Thomas, you can replace this flower with another flower. Uh, a flower is simply something that might reflect God's beauty, but it doesn't individuate that beauty. Scotus is saying something different. Every single thing has eternal value. Every single thing has the love of God in a unique, unclonable, never to be repeated way. So as Gerard Manley Hopkins said, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. You'd never know it the way we look at the world today and what the news is conveying, a world of war, a world of pandemic, a world of violence, a world that is deeply divided. And the question is, I think we have to honestly ask, how can we have this many Franciscans? How can we have this many Christians? How, year after year, century after century, and have this kind of world? Something clearly has not connected. Something has gone off the track. So 
But one thing I think that needs to be lived out ever more fully is that Franciscan life is a sacramental life. And by sacrament, we mean anything that awakens, that alivens and expands our imagination. Anything that opens us up to its depth dimension, which is its God dimension. So, um, you know, the sacramental life is really a life of the vision of the inner eye. You know, Bonaventure would speak of the three eyes following the victories, the two eye, physical eyes and the eye of the heart. So we are not to only to see with our physical eyes, we are to see with the eye of the heart. That's the sacramental eye. And that's the eye that makes us sensitive to all that exists. Francis, in his, this is what he wrote about, admonition one. It's his first admonition, or in a sense, the lessons he wants to be bequeathed to the brothers. <clears throat> he quotes from the Gospel of John. Philip says to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. It's like us saying, well, you know, show us God. Where is God? And Jesus says to him, Philip, have I been with you for so long a time, and you yet do not know me? Whoever sees me, sees also my father. So that's Francis, right? God, you know, in fact, for Francis, the incarnation is the father that moves to the lowest depths of re created reality. That this is a God who literally becomes not God to be God for us. This is a world that is deeply filled with this incredible mystery of divine love. So physical sight, as Jesus is asking his own followers, physical sight is integrated with spiritual sight. We have to open up to see the truth of this world. And our question is, what blocks us in our vision? What blocks our vision? What makes it so difficult to see? And that's what the Eucharist is about. That's why Francis had a deep love of the Eucharist. Not, not because it was a me and Jesus thing, like, oh, Jesus loves me and I love Jesus and we're going to, you know, he's going to save me. Not, it's not that at all, actually. You know, you're saved by what you love, quite honestly. So the body of Christ is that body that, that expresses, that is the love of God made flesh. And that's why Francis, you know, I think it's... Um, even in his own writings, he speaks about picking up. So the scriptures, the word of God for Francis is not a piece of paper. It's the word of God made flesh on paper. So he treated the scriptures the same way he treated the sacrament of the body of Christ with deep, deep reverence. And that's why everything, you know, we know the stories of how he's walking in the woods and he would see two twigs in the form of the cross and he would bend low, you know, in adoration because that, you know, that those twigs, that was the body of Christ. And that's what we see in Francis. The whole thing is the body of Christ. The sacrament is just that. It sacramentalizes, it symbolizes what the whole reality is. So I find it almost shocking sometimes <laughs> the way people, they treat the, the Eucharist like a private piety, like a private devotion, or, you know, they uh, don't bother me because, you know, it's a me and Jesus time. This is definitely not what it is. It's just the opposite. It is being brought into this incredible reality of the love of God throughout all of life. And of course, Francis, you know, he lived the body of Christ. That's the whole point of Francis. He, he didn't just, you know, have it as a devotion. He was the body, that, that, that body became his body, right? So that's how he began to see the world. And we know the story towards the end of his life, you know, Francis did work with the lepers for a number of years. He had a very poor lifestyle, so he was physically a very sick man. He probably had a lot of gastrointestinal disease. He probably had glaucoma, and he likely contracted leprosy. He was blind towards the end of his life. And of course, the story goes that he was living behind in a little hut behind the convent of San Damiano, where Claire and her sisters lived. 
and the light <clears throat> of day uh, was stinging to his eyes because they were sick. He had a uh, glaucoma and and therefore light was, he couldn't take the light of day. He had to be in darkness. And so he's in this hut and he's sort of complaining, you know, God, how long do I have to suffer here? How long do it, will this go on? And he hears a voice coming from deep within him and saying, Francis, if you were to exchange your sufferings for an, for an earth transformed in gold, you know, would, would you do so? The alchemist, right? That which purifies us. And he says, Lord, of course I would, you know. And he, begin, he awakens and begins to sing the canticle of the sun. This canticle really summarizes Francis's whole spirituality, his, his life. It begins, I can't point this out to you because I don't have a pointer here, but it begins here on most high, right? That incredible self-diffusive love of God that's all powerful, you know, the ultimate goodness of God is flowing throughout all creation. Yours are the praises, the glory and all blessing. To you alone, most high, uh, the ineffable God. You know, we don't know who God, where God lives, as Thomas Merton says. We think we know God. If we think we know God, we probably don't know God at all. That's not God. My like God is always more than we could ever grasp. And, and that's what Francis uses language here of the most high. It's the ineffable God. To you do, does everything belong because no one is really worthy to mention your name. You are mystery beyond what we can grasp. But he says that your mystery, who you are in this, in this ineffable mystery of love is here in this creation. Be praised, my Lord, through all your creatures. And we know how this, this beautiful song goes. My Lord, brother, sun, sister, moon, right? Brother wind, sister water, brother fire. So here we have the, the wind, the water, the, the, the fire, and sister mother earth. So these are symbolic, right? The earth, air, fire, water are the four elements, uh, classically the four elements of the cosmos. So we are speaking here of the cosmic Christ right? This is the love of God incarnate throughout the whole creation. And then, you know, Francis, we know, wrote this hymn in stages. This is the first part. In the second stage, Francis comes back to, in a sense, give praise to God for forgiveness, right? We can't live in this cosmic Christ, this cosmic reality, unless we forgive through those who give pardon for your love. And forgiveness is never easy, right? It's not like saying, oh, sure, I forgive you, you know, and just move on. It's bearing the difficulties that forgiveness sometimes brings, bearing infirmity and tribulation. So here is a key passage to how to live in this beautiful canticle of creation. It is taking up the cross in our own lives, right? It is enduring uh, through those we find difficult, through those who don't understand us, through those who reject us, um, and maybe finding a way to love in the midst of those sorrows. And then Francis goes on to say, if we can live in that love, that's the deeper love that calls us to persevere through the fragilities of life into a depth of vision. He said, blessed are those then who endure in peace. Peace is that inner reconciliation of love. Um, in other words, peace is not just living without conflict. Peace is living in the love of God, in the grace of God. Peace is a gift, right? Peace I give to you, Jesus says, my peace, the spirit of love. Um, blessed are those who endure. So, for Francis, it's not just like, peace be with you, you know, like we do in church, peace be with you. I mean, what is that? P people are like, peace be with you, and then they don't talk to one another, like, you know, after that. It's, we're, I'm telling you, we're so superficial. It, it's no wonder we have the work, work world we have today. Because uh, Francis' way of life is about a depth dimension of life. We have to endure in peace. We have to not just live in peace. We have to stay put in it. For by you, most high, they shall be crowned. 
And then this third passage also is an insight to how to live in this cosmic reality of the Christ. Praise be you, my Lord, through our sister bodily death from no living human can escape, right? We will all die. So the question is, how will we live in the face of our own mortality? If you were to know you were gonna to die tomorrow, how would you live? If you were gonna die in the next moment, how might you live in this moment? That's the question here. Francis, I think, always lived uh, a, a, a life in death and a death in life. He lived with the greater sense of the whole, of our own fragile, finite more, you know, uh, human existence. And then he gives us the key to how to live, um, you might say, with death as a reality. Woe to those who die in mortal sin. Mortal sin are those sins that fracture, you know, life in a wounded way, wounding ourselves, wounding God and wounding others. And he says, how can we avoid that kind of sin? Blessed are those whom death will find in your most holy will key, for the second death will do them no harm. So Francis is talking about not one death, but two deaths. We have to, you know, the old adage, die to self. It always sounded so terrible. Actually, when I was in Minavishit, you have to die to yourself. It means really living in the spirit of deeper poverty, letting go, you know. Dying to self is, you know, forgetting what, what was said in order to love in a new way. Um, we have to die over and over and over again. Again, those of you living in marriage and community life, you kind of know this. If, if you've sustained yourself in that life for a long period of time, we have to die over and over if we really seek to live. And we live not because, you know, we just um, made it our point, we're gonna just live on. We live through our relationships of love. Francis was remembered not because he had a bad diet, you know, and hung around with love. He lived because of the way he loved. And that's what I think eternal life is. We live in the enduring relationships of our loves. And those loves, the deeper love requires a second death. And that's in a sense how our lives give praise and bless God uh, through thanksgiving and the service with great humility, knowing who we are, what we are before God, Francis says, is who we are and nothing more. Our task is not to be other than what we are. Our task is to be what we are in the true giftedness of our own lives. And I think it's unfortunate that our culture is always wanting to make us into what we're not. You know, we have so many idols out there. You know, you're supposed to look like this and you're supposed to be wealthy and beautiful and, you know, young and instead of like poor and old and decrepit looking. And that's not how God sees us at all. God loves us exactly as we are. And our task is to love ourselves as we are and to give thanks. Right, so this canticle of the sun, this, this vision of the cosmic reality of Christ is to be our vision and we can live it, but we have some things to do. Uh, this is Bonaventure's saying, which I think is a beautiful saying uh, because it, it's, it speaks to the heart of Francis. You truly exist where you are, where you love. Yeah. You are at home where you love, not merely where you live. There's just a million and one examples of where people are living together or living in a place where they're not at home. They're not at home with themselves. They're not at home with one another. And therefore it's a life of conflict. It's a life of fragments. It's a life of loneliness. It's a life of lovelessness, right? And so the Franciscan way is first of all, to find our true beingness. That is the root. It's the root reality of this tradition. You truly exist where you love. And where your love, of course, is where your heart is. And where your heart is, is where your mind is. And, and actually the whole thing here is about freedom. Where you love is where you are most free. 
and where you're most free is where you're most yourself and where you're most yourself is where you can give that self away. Um, and therefore, I think our attention and our efforts are sometimes scattered all over the place. And uh, we have a very thinned out, fragmented life. So I do think I, I personally would love to see this tradition come back to its contemplative roots. Francis is first and foremost a man of prayer. Uh, contemplation is really, in a sense, shaping that mind to the mind of God. It's, it's really falling in love with God and staying there. And therefore, I think, you know, for ourselves today, we have to make choices at every moment, right? We're all workaholics. We're all scattered all over the place. We're all living in fragmented time. And I think, well, the question for us is where are our minds at any moment? Where do we really love? Where do we find our freedom? Um, I do think, you know, moments of solitude are not just important, they're essential. You have to find the place solitude is not necessarily being alone, although that is helpful, you know, going on retreat or going to a quiet place. Solitude is being alone with God. We have examples of holy people, even Francis himself, Claire. Uh, she, she, Claire did not live in a quiet hut. Claire lived in an open dormitory with a lot of other women. And yet she wrote all about contemplation. Right, she wrote all about focusing that mind on God. That's what solitude's about. It's about deepening that mind uh, in the heart and deepening that heart in God. You can be in a crowded mall and be in solitude. You can be in the midst of a leper colony and be in solitude. It's where we find that deeper inner self. But I think in our own age, cyber fast. We have to unplug, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a, a culprit, maybe like many of you, we're sort of computer addicted. Um, we're computer dependent for uh, almost all our needs now, and we can't get away from it. And I do think this is now, we either have to find a way to use computer life to deepen our minds in love, or we have to unplug from them so we can, in a sense, harness those energies of love within. So this is a saying from Bonaventure that really I think captures again, um, that spirit of Francis, um, the Franciscan way of loving this world into its, uh, into its beauty. In beautiful things, Francis saw beauty itself, and from each and everything he climbed up to embrace his beloved. In other words, it's how we do anything, how we get our cup of coffee in the morning, how we sit down to breakfast, how we you know, walk to work, how we even plug on our computer, everything. How do we do whatever we're doing? That is what makes a fundamental difference to how we are helping this world become in love or not. Beatrice Bruteau says, we're not going to change this world with, you know, justice, just works of justice. We're not going to change with economic plans. We're not going to change with anything. Our politics are, well, that's another story, but they're not really helping matters either. Here's where I think, you know, we, we, we treat spirituality as something that's private, you know, like, oh, theology, that's nice. You study that, you know, or I'm a Franciscan. That's great. Well, that should be front and center, right? We must first be spiritual if we are really going to be material. Um, and that's what she's basically saying here in her own way. Beatrice Bouteau was a, uh, a modern contemplative. She died just a few years ago, a follower of Teilhard de Chardin, but someone who had a deep resonance with Francis of Assisi because he could have said this. An entire attitude, mindset, way of identifying self and others and perceiving the world has to shift first before any talk of economic, political, and social arrangements can be made. Anything else is premature, useless, and possibly dangerous. And unfortunate, we, we tend to place the latter part here over the first, and it's thinning us out. We're actually not becoming a more unified world. Um, we have to change. We have to shift. So sin is living in the exile of unrelatedness. 
how do we know if we live in sin? The question is, where are you? You know, um, what is blocking your your um, ability to to love? Um, what is causing you to resist being part of the whole that is the body of Christ? That's in a sense what we have to attend to. And then, you know, it's not to stay there, it's to say then, well, how can I turn in a new direction? Teilhard, Teilhard de Jardin, by the way, is someone I study, but I think he should have been a Franciscan rather than a Jesuit. He has a deeply Franciscan heart and um, was deeply influenced by the Franciscans, the few that he knew. But he says at one point, he says, love alone can bring us to the threshold of another universe. And the question is, do we really believe that? You know, do we really believe in the power of love? Or do we just think that love is something that we can fall in and out of, but it's not a real power, not a power like politics and economics? Or do we really believe that this power of love can change things? Uh, Francis of Assisi believed in that power of love uh, to the point um, where at the end of his life, he lived so deeply in that love uh, that he became that love. And here's the, here is the key. We are to be transformed into the one we love. That's what love does. Love changes the lover into the beloved. And you know, the, you know that Francis was known as the second Christ, right? An altar Christus, another Christ. Uh, Thomas of Chilano writes in his second uh, biography, one of the brothers, you know, it's, he says, at the very same hour that evening, the glorious father appeared to another brother of praiseworthy life. So Thomas is writing the life of Francis as uh, mimicking or imitating the life of Je Jesus. So we have the resurrected Francis, right? And uh, several uh, brothers separated themselves from the crowd and said to the brother, is this not Christ, brother? And he replied, it is he. Others asked him again, isn't this St. Francis? And the brother likewise said, it was he. For it really seemed to that brother and to the whole crowd as if Christ and St. Francis were one person. This is Thomas of Chilano in chapter 150. 65, 165. And so that's the thing. There is the key. Francis understood this in his own way. There is no other Christ out there. Wear it. Christ has no body now on our on earth but ours. Uh, no hands but ours, as St. Teresa wrote in her prayer. <laughs> we are the love of God enfleshed. And Francis he understood this in his own deeply spiritual, intuitive way. When he says at the end of his life, I have done what was mine to do. May Christ teach you what is yours. We are part of this body of Christ. We are what this body will become. So if we're hoping that God is going to do something without us, we are in for a big surprise. God can't do anything apart from us. We are that love of God now. Uh, we are the ones who can give voice to that love of God. We are the ones who can see this world in its God depth reality. We are the Christ in the flesh. And so I think to be a Franciscan is a great vocation, but we have to live it, right? We have to, in a sense, become in our own time, in our own way, we have to now enter into this spirit of Francis. And I think we have to, in our own time, live this out in our own deep way. So um, it's 1233. Uh, and I would say, let's just take 10 minutes or so um, for some discussion. I don't know if you want to stand, you need a stand up break a little bit. Do you want a stand up break? Yes, you want to stand okay, up? Yeah. Let's take a 10 minute stand up break and then um, <clears throat> let's come back. And I see some questions here 
uh, in the chat. That's great. Let's let's address those questions and have some discussion together. Okay. Sound good? good? All right. Great. <clears throat> We're coming to <clears throat> our last segment here. I see some questions in the chat. So let me. <clears throat> <laughs> Thank, thanks, Valerie. That's good of you. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me take some of the questions here, and then we'll just open it up for some discussion. Okay. Um, I think we're up here. Uh, I think we we addressed Valerie's question. Be yeah, not 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 to we can't grasp God on the run for sure. How do how how or where do we start to change our ways and attitudes? That are poor models of our Franciscanism, like to stop being impatient, oblivious, and not humble. Well, it's called the human condition, actually, isn't it? You know, I think I think we have to be we have to be patient with ourselves, right? So we um, <clears throat> sometimes we place a lot of demands on ourselves, and I think one thing about Francis, he had a lot of patience with uh, you know with, with himself and with people. So you know, he was hard on himself. He was very patient with others. And I think maybe that's uh, something to think about. Like we have to be demanding in ourselves, but patient with others. We have to really make our effort to to try to try all we can to live in that that depth of God's love within us. But at the same time, realizing um, everyone is struggling. I think to be a human is a very difficult vocation. To be a human person, right? It's difficult. We're, we're fragile creatures. We, we get wounded easily because in a sense, we're incomplete. We're certainly incomplete without that love of God filling us to completion. And so I think we're always longing for that completion. We're sort of persons, we're like children wait, wanting to grow up. You know, when you're a kid, it was like, I can't wait till I get you know, get to be an older person so no one can tell me what to do type thing. <laughs> well, we're kind of a little bit the opposite. We're, we want to be that person that is really filled with the love of God that can begin to live this love in a dynamic way. And so I think we have to be patient with one another. Uh, so people aren't going to get it. <clears throat> They're not going to change. They're going to go, oh, you went to Sister Ilya's talk. That's great. Now, you know, everyone's... <laughs> um, People are like, nah, I don't like that stuff. You know, I don't believe in that. You know, all this kind of stuff. So, you know, okay, all right. As Jesus would say, if you don't find peace there, just kind of shake the dust from your feet and just keep moving on. You know, just keep loving in a new way and just keep. Don't let. So it's a question of what do we allow into our lives? What do we allow to really affect us? That's the question. Um, our, uh, our responsibility in Laudato Si. Yeah, we're not Thomas, Bob, so we're, we are Franciscans. So you're right, Thomism would say that we have dominion, you know, God gave us dominion over the earth. Well, that really belies everything that science is telling us today, right? We are creatures of the earth. In fact, Francis would be completely at home with that, right? The earth is, he called the earth our mother, sister, mother earth, right? Because the earth nurtures us, right? No earth, no humans. That's how it goes. We can't survive without the earth. So we have to really treat it with much greater respect. And I don't think it's about custodians. Like, like we're not here to take care of the earth. We are here to relate to the earth. That's a huge difference, right? We're not just caretakers. We are brothers and sisters. That is the Franciscan position. So um, yes, I would agree that it is similar to Native American spirituality, that deep spiritual thread. Here we're just identifying that thread more specifically as the love of God, right? That goodness of God that permeates all, um, that weaves all together into a unity. We have to live that, I think, a little bit more uh, explicitly and not be afraid to, to live it and to speak about it. How do we navigate pro-life dilemmas? Yes, I realize that, you know, it is, it's difficult. People have different positions today on these very, very huge life choices. 
I would say, and this is what Francis would say, you love the person and not their position, right? You're, you're not here about loving positions. You're here about loving persons. You can't change people's, you know, you can change people by your example. You can change people. I think we use the wrong tactics. You know, we're, we come in like all guns and, you know, we're like little battleships. Like, yeah, I'm going to tell you exactly what I think here, you know, and people are like, well, you're not going to tell me anything. Right? The old adage, a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. A person, you will actually drive someone deeper into their own position but through confrontation and opposition. Love is transformative. You could say, well, hmm, I don't quite see the way you see, but I can appreciate why you might see in that way. I, I don't I don't share those concerns. But um, and we shouldn't honestly, if we let politics divide us, we have nothing that you know. If, if that's it, God is not here. If if that's where we're living from, this is truly an atheistic culture. It is without God, right? We have a choice to make. We're not here as politicians. We're here as people who seek to live out that love of God. We have to know, first of all, what we are and what we stand for, not politically, spiritually. And out of that spirituality, then we might take a stance in the face of people who do not see our positions. Um, I, I think this this um, does this does this allow? Yeah, I guess it, you know it does. I'm not a politician, so I, I'm not making laws. But honestly, I think the way we're going about things is actually it's divisive. It is volatile. We're just creating a world that's ripe for extinction. Quite honestly, it's like please, you know, we're like living living little time bombs. We're like, yeah, please blow us up because we can't live together anymore. This is not God. This is not God at all. This is a world without God. <clears throat> and so, you know, the question is, we we claim to be God lovers. We claim to be Franciscans. We claim to be rooted in that love of God. I want to say, if you want to live countercultural, counter culture would be to live that love of God in the most explicit way. You have to do the opposite of exactly where you think your natural tendencies want to go. Our natural tendencies want to fight and resist. Francis would do just the opposite. That's what, that's his genius. The spiritual person does not see with worldly eyes. The spiritual person sees with God eyes. That's a whole different vision. So we have work to do. And it's going to be difficult. That's the whole point, by the way. Hello, you know. Yeah, no, no, this is not like the Amazon nine step program to holiness <clears throat> where you can go online, get a package that says become a holy person, you know, and just take a pill for nine days and you'll be holy. It just doesn't work like that. It's very difficult work, but it can be done and you will find joy in it ultimately. Um, <clears throat> how do we wholeheartedly say, I still love you no matter what you decide without condoning judgment, but by providing resources for options or just a hug? Well said, that's right. Maybe just a hug. Maybe you don't have to say very much, but don't feel that person loves the love of creation. Well, you know, that's sad, quite honestly, but hug that person tightly, please. But it isn't for me to say who loved and who doesn't love. That is correct since it implies judgment. That is true. And honestly, uh, love is one of those um, deep, deep bonds of connectivity that really is shaped by family, by environment, by experiences growing up. You know, and if you grew up, if a person grew up in an unlovable environment, or if someone told them the whole time, I wish you were never born, you know, you're such a, you know, you're such a waste, your life is a waste. Type thing. Well, a person's gonna think, my God, I have no value here, right? And so the, it, it's, it's a very, very unhealthy and very sad situation. We have to, there's not enough love in the world. <clears throat> so it's not a matter of judging who's gonna love and who isn't. There's just not enough of it, right? You know, the Beatles were right. All you need is love, right? And it sounds so simple. But it's very difficult. 
That is the Christian story, right? God so loved the world that God sent God's only son. That's the whole point of it, right? But we've made it into everything else. Uh, slow down, focus, right? Did Francis ever reconcile with his father? Yes, there is some, um, I haven't done the research on this in quite a while, but I do believe there was some reconciliation later on. Uh, I don't think his father showed up for all his, you know, preaching stints or whatever, but, and I'm sure his father was always perhaps slightly disappointed that Francis chose the path, but a father who really loves their kid will ultimately come around, you know, one way or the other. God made a balanced creation to express our love. We need to understand this balance. Well, uh, Bob, I don't think it's so much a balanced creation. Love, by the way, is always chaotic, right? So love is never like, if you if it's this, we're usually dead, right? If it's usually a baseline, it means that there's nothing happening. So uh, where there are human beings uh, striving to love, there's always going to be chaos, right? Chaos is not a bad thing if you understand the science of chaos. So what we're called to be, and here I'm going to borrow from science, <clears throat> we're not called to be closed systems, right? A closed system is a box, right? And so I, I'm boxed in on all four sides. And if I use up all the energy in that system, all I can do is die out. So a closed system needs constant input of energy. An open system is a system that's open to the environment. So an open system is always that one that lives far from equilibrium. It's always like in slight fluctuation, which is basically my life, always in slight fluctuation. But it's open to new patterns. That's the whole beauty of it. Chaos means new patterns of order can emerge out of existing patterns. I think, quite honestly, I think Christianity can be interpreted as a open system. It's a chaotic system. So is Francis's way of life. Here's this person, or like Jesus. Jesus was Jewish, right? Here's this Jew talking about the love of God and the, and the reign of God at hand. What? This is crazy. Uh, and Jesus disrupted the pattern of everyday Jewish life, right? He disrupted the people around him. So if you wanna be a Christian, if you wanna be a Franciscan, <clears throat> you have to be not a balanced person, you have to be a destabilizer. You have to destabilize because God is active and alive here. God is doing new things. Uh, what God promises is a new heaven and a new earth, not just kind of surviving here, we are called to transform here. That's the whole point. So this is much more adventurous than I think a way a lot of people live this. We're like, oh, we can't, you know, make sure everything is okay. It's like that, that's what happens when you're in the coffin. You know, everything is okay because you're, you're not just lying flat. If you're standing upright, <clears throat> things will never be quite okay. And that's okay. Because God is there and God is inviting you to see in a new way, to love in a new way, to attend in a new way. So <clears throat> get on board with a God who is <clears throat> kind of wild in love. If I used to like put it that way, God's wildly in love. So you spoke of gratitude. Yes. <clears throat> I think I need some water. Hold on. <clears throat> um, uh, Solanus Casey, yes, a wonderful holy man, right? Capuchin, uh, began his prayers with gratitude to God. Yes, <clears throat> I this was expressed more as we owe God a great deal of gratitude. Well, rather than the we, how about just me? Like, let's just start with, am I grateful? Do I live in that sense of gratitude? So we're always trying to, I find it funny today, we always want this kind of, you know, uh, we want to change everyone. Well, change yourself, you will change everyone if you really yourself make that radical change. Uh, gratitude's excellent. Uh, just wake up and say, thank you. Thank you for opening my eyes. Thank you for this, the air I breathe. Thank you for the light that I can see. Uh, thank you for the pain that I had this morning in my arm because I'm now attentive to my own fragility. Uh, thank you for everything. <clears throat> oh, you're welcome. Do you think we are coming to the end of our days? Not at all. Well, 
let me take that back. Mm. I think we live in a very uh, open universe. I think this universe will extend billions of years into the future. I think God is inexhaustible in love. God is inexhaustible in creativity. God cannot be outdone, quite honestly. Now, we can mess up this creation. Oh, yes. Can we do that? Mm-hmm. Yep. As we're doing a pretty good job right now, we can also change. We can also turn the tables here. So <clears throat> we keep waiting for everyone else to do everything. You know, we want the politicians to do things. We want the church to do things. Well, how about we just do it, right? How about we just, in our everyday, we are, in a sense, what the church is, what the world is, what, what everything is in this moment. Right? We're the thinking, the thinking earth. <clears throat> we will come to the end of our days if we lose hope. And I think one who lives in God does not lose hope. Where there's love, <clears throat> there's hope, there's faith, there's vision, there's future. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I don't think we are coming to the end of our days. We're coming to the end of this period in our history and something new is breaking in. Um, yesterday, just to, just to go to show you how conversations can be different. <clears throat> yes, the last two days, I, I spoke with scientists. Yesterday, I spoke with someone who studies the origins of the universe. This person uh, is not a believer, but deeply, deeply enamored by the mystery of the origins of the universe. I mean, it. our story is really, really, God is really, really awesome. Not just awesome, I mean incredibly awesome. The day before that, I spoke with someone who studies extraterrestrial life, life on other planets. The cosmos, we're just a little planet here in a cosmos of millions and billions of stars and galaxies. And and you know, the, the, the psalmist, when I look at the heavens and the moon and the stars which you arrange, who are we, oh God, and who are you? I mean, we need a reality check here. Seriously, you think this is God's gonna be like, oh, those people, they didn't get it right. They're really messing it up. You know? <laughs> well, God's gonna be like, you messed it up because you made the wrong choices. But um, <clears throat> slow down, really breathe in, pay attention to what science is telling us about the beauty and awesome, it's an awesome, awesome universe i can't tell you how just incredible and here's the thing scientists who usually be like yeah i don't need god you know they're like uh well there is a mystery here we can't name you know uh and they're always kind of a little bit reticent i don't know if i want to use a god but beauty it's it's really incredible beauty uh it's it's good beyond i could ever imagine and so science and religion, believe it or not, they are inadvertently coming together. And Francis would be like, yes, you know, right? Because this, this place that is our home is incredible. I mean, it is incredible. This earth, this incredible nature. Oh my gosh, we use that term nature like we actually know what nature is. Clueless. Nature is a bubbling of interconnected life that is beyond, it dazzles me when I read about it, the way mushrooms, rhizomes, rhizomic life, the way trees talk to one another. They're probably like, do you see her? She's waving her hands over there, you know? Um, <clears throat> nature is fully alive, really. It's, and it's probably feeling in some ways the pain that we cause it by neglect by our attitudes of superiority, that we humans are something better than nature. Um, I think really, this is what Francis teaches us. Bend down, you know, be what you are. Humility comes from the Latin humus, right? Earth, like Adam, like Adama, earthiness. We're earthy people, that's what it is. So be earthy, right? Be earthy because in that earth, is absolute mystery, right? We don't know what that, hold it, you know, hug a tree, um, you know, feel the, the leaves of the flowers um, because uh, we, are, we, we are immersed in beauty. We are immersed in love and we're so blind. 
so wrapped up in ourselves, so self-preoccupied. And we've created a world that actually helps us become self-preoccupied. So Franciscans have, you know, it's not just advocating for the poor. Let's advocate for law. Let's advocate to be human. Like that's our number one priority. First be human, then learn how to love as a human person, and then learn how to live in that love as a human person. To forgive, to, to be at peace, to see the future, to, to have hope, you know, that God is here, that God is doing new things. So um, I think that it is, uh, do you have any outstanding, I read them all from the chats. Do you have any outstanding questions that you might wanna ask uh, or anything you'd like to share in our closing time? I mean, can we open this up for a little of discussion or what? I would like to uh, call upon Father Jack Clark Robinson to speak to us for a second or two. Sure. He is our he's our beginning. Um, All right. Let me see if I can find him on my in the participants here. Just bear with me. Yes, I I saw Father Jack here. Yeah, he is. Okay, here. Father Jack, you can uh, you can unmute yourself. Oh. There you are. There I am. Uh, well, thank you. I, th this is a, a hardly deserved honor uh, in terms of asking me to speak, but uh, because Ilya has done just a wonderful job. I, I said at the very beginning, I was looking back through, I have notes of Ilya from a class that she gave in Canterbury in 2004, when I had the privilege of being there. And uh, it just, you know, the, the continuing work that you have done uh, with creation and uh, and the Franciscan connection to creation and uh, all, all of this, I just it's uh, thank you very very much and okay. my my deep appreciation that uh, for all of the people in San Antonio who keep the Fiesta Franciscana going uh, and uh, I uh, pointed out I see I see. Noe and Paul and Brother Tim at the conventuals. Uh, and I know that Brother Timothy has been involved for years and years and years, as has Stan and so many others um, there. I, I am just truly thrilled that, that the uh, Fiesta continues to go. And I think I'm scheduled to be there in two years to be the speaker, and that's going to be in person. <laughs> I, I know that's going to be in person. We're going to, to, to be able to do that. And I see Kathy Pierce up at the top too, another old great friend. So um, I just want to, to, to applaud all of the work and effort that goes into keeping this going and, um, I, I am truly humbled that that it is still going, and I am truly thankful to you, Ilya, uh, for for what you've done today. Thanks, Dad. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, does anybody else um, have anything to share? Uh, uh, let me open my chat again here. Does anybody else have any important question or or uh, for Sister Delia? Otherwise. What I want to do is unmute my unmute everybody so we can show our appreciation for Sister Delio. So let me uh, try and unmute everyone before we pray um, our closing prayer. Okay, if everybody you you have permission to unmute yourselves and um, uh, express our gratitude to Sister Delio. Thank it's you, been Sister. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Really blessed. Very good. Okay. Okay, Val, would you like to lead us in prayer? My pleasure. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace we have received through Sister Elia and for the wonderful wisdom she has provided us the insight that you have given us through Sister Elia. We ask 